afternoon, everybody. Welcome to FITM's ongoing series we call The Future Of, uh, where we kind of look to the future of all kinds of different topics. This month, we're talking about health and wellness. I'm Tom Hincanius, the co-chair of FITM's Bachelor in Digital Marketing, as well as Graphic Design Programs and our Visual Communications Program. I, I certainly cannot be the only one who opens anything and sees the word wellness just about everywhere. Just this morning, in fact, I logged into Twitter and there was a post celebrating the well plus being section that is debuting today from the Washington Post. Uh, it's it's as fascinating time. And as Mintel reports, consumers have been rocked by health concerns during the pandemic, making this the ripe time for wellness brands. And since this series is about the future of, I also thought it was particularly interesting to see Mintel's projections for the future of wellness. So now increased attention in the space on specifically health and wellness. Next, demanding respect and representation from brands. And then the future of the wellness space, according to Mintel, is supporting things like the menopausal journey. It's really interesting if you read into this a bit. The women who have aged with apps that will track their period will look for the same sort of support from apps and brands as they move into the next phases of their life. So with all of that in mind, let's get right to our panelists who can speak about this way more intelligently than I can. We'll be, get, uh, we'll be joined in a bit rather by Janine Guerrero. She's a Javadan, J Jividon, excuse me. She is the head of marketing and digital transformation. We'll ask her about how scent and fragrance are central to well-being. We'll also be joined by two founders because if you follow this series, you know I love to look at these trends through the lens of the startup space. So Ashlyn Cousteau and Jill Belasco will join us. And together they started Seaweed Naturals, which is a THC-based product range. What's especially interesting in that is they'll speak about how the fastest growing group in the cannabis space is actually women over the age of 45. You can kind of figure out how that aligns with health and wellness. Our first guest is Allie Compton. Allie was one of Credo Beauty's first employees when she joined the team for the company's launch back in 2015. Currently, Allie is product developer for Credo Beauty's own brands, uh, which include Exa Beauty, which includes Color Cosmetics, as well as Eleven by Venus Williams, and that's a sun, sun care line, uh, where she leads their product innovation, development, packaging, design across the categories. So, Allie, I, I thought maybe we could start talking, asking you about what you asked me when we first started talking about joining this panel, you said, what do you mean by wellness? So I want to turn that question right back on you. In other words, what what is wellness to you? How does Credo Beauty look at wellness? Yeah, Tom, after our conversation, I actually was very curious myself, and I looked up the definition of wellness. And Oxford defines it as the state of being in good health especially as an actively pursued goal, which I found very interesting. Um, but at Credo, I don't know if you guys know what Credo means, but it means I believe in Latin. And we believe that our beauty product, that beauty products that are meant to make you feel good about yourself as you're using them should also be good for your health and they should be better for the planet. So from, from day one, it's really been our mission at Credo, and it's to change the way that people think about what they put on their bodies. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, there's no legal or even really an agreed upon definition of clean beauty in the beauty industry. And our Credo Clean Standard is the highest in the beauty industry so far. So we've banned over 2,500 ingredients, and those ingredients together make up our dirty list. And um, I also wanted to share on the topic of wellness that earlier this year, we hosted a clean beauty summit in LA. So it was kind of our first like back in-person event. Um, and a lot of consumers came out to support the event as well. And we asked our attendees, what does clean beauty mean to you? And someone answered honoring your authentic self which I, I love that definition because it is really up to the consumer to define the terms wellness, to define what beauty means to them, to define clean beauty. And at Credo, we're here to welcome all of the interpretations. Um, it's also, it's no secret that the beauty industry is oversaturated and it's full of options, mm -hmm. but I think customers are making a more conscious effort to choose products that are helping to promote their overall well-being. 
Um, so, so many interesting threads I could pick up on in there. I want to come back to the dirty list in a second that you just mentioned. For now, just maybe let's pick up on the theme that everybody's included in this space, um, that, that, that you know, it's about authentic self. Um, to me, when you say wellness, this, there's, there is this inclusivity element to it. As, as a company, how do you all see that inclusivity in action? It, well, we believe clean beauty is inclusive and it's definitely for everyone and we want everyone to feel welcome and to know that there's a seat at the beauty table for you, um, regardless of how you're defining wellness or beauty. And we have over 130 brands, uh, over 2000 of the best in clean beauty products. And we really aim to create a welcoming space for all beauty lovers, all beauty lovers. So we value equity and inclusion, and we partner with a lot of women and BIPOC led companies. And we also, unfortunately, but it must, it had to be done. We identified a white space in the clean beauty world. And in an effort to help to bring more inclusive, inclusivity to clean beauty, we created a color cosmetics brand called Exa Beauty. And this brand launched in August of 2020. We launched with 43 shades of foundation, which is still the most inclusive line of clean foundation to date. And we noticed previously in the Credo assortment that there was really a lack of shade range, um, especially catering to, to deeper skin tones. And it was just unacceptable for us. And we couldn't turn a blind eye to that. And Exa Beauty was created in response to that. And we also partnered with Venus Williams to create a mineral sunscreen line. It's all zinc oxide based, but has an invisible finish for all skin tones. So there is no none of the dreaded white white gray cast on deeper skin tones. It's, it's the, the work that you all are doing is so fascinating to me. I, I really enjoy digging into this deeper. Um, and, and so now let's let's go into this dirty list that I, I was saying. I, I kind of want to ask some more questions about. It, basically, if I understand you right, you're saying that to get into Credo Beauty Store, which also includes an online element, uh, a product cannot contain these 2,500 plus ingredients. So is the dirty list something y'all created? Is this an industry agreed to standard? Uh, is there is there an industry standard for clean beauty? Where, where does the space exist? Yep. So when we launched back in 2015, we also debuted our dirty list at that time. And that's the over the 2,500 ingredients that we prohibit. And that's due to either safety or sustainability reasons. And so, no, there's there was and is no industry standard. So we had to define clean. And we're proud now to have the highest standards in beauty. Um, and also as the largest retailer of clean beauty on the planet. Um, we product safety, obviously, that's a huge part of our mission and it's ongoing work. And it, it's not just, you know, add an ingredient to the dirty list and then we're done. It's continued research over time and it's active work. It's not, it's, it's continuing to evolve as well. And there's more research coming out daily on ingredients that we have to look yeah. in. But also there's a focus on sustainability and yeah. ethics there too. So no animal tested products are allowed at Credo. Um, we respect the planet as well. So we created almost as a second part to our dirty list, um, our sustainable packaging guidelines. And we also co-founded PACT, which is a first of its kind um, collection program for hard to recycle beauty packaging. So we encourage our customers to bring back their empty products when they're done using them and drop them off at their nearest Credo store. And they every time they do that, they receive reward points. Um, also, last year, we banned all single-use items at Credo, including the little sampling sachets that you get with purchases normally when you purchase beauty products. Uh, and we introduced Rejar, which is our new sustainable way of sampling in the store. And our Rejars are made with a plant fiber polymer, uh, and that's derived from an upcycled green tea fiber. So these little jars can be reused a number of times. So we're not encouraging waste. 
I, I kind of want to look at this from a, a broader business perspective um, and see where we can, you know, people from other industries might be able to derive some interesting learnings from the work that you all are doing. So when when I think about the Credo's beauty list and the seal of approval that you basically are giving these, these uh, brands as they come into your store, in other words, would Credo become the industry standard since the industry doesn't have a standard, which in the end helps grow your brand awareness while also delivering more awareness to the category. So all, all boats, you know, rise in a rising tide kind of situation. Yeah, we, well, we would love to see a unified standard, but the industry is still highly underregulated. And I think we all have work to do in order mm. to impact the industry as a whole and, and create change. But Thus, when we when we introduced our dirty lists, we really did disrupt the way that things had always been done. So we're continuing to pave the way there with encouraging innovative, sustainable packaging and more transparent and ethical practices, especially down to sourcing in the supply chain. So we we hope that there is a standard, whether it's us one day or not. But right now, we we just have work to do to keep keep encouraging change. My last question, what, what is the future of this health and wellness space? Is this a trend? Do you feel like it's here to stay? Where, where's your, I mean, you guys have been around since we, we talked, 2015, when you joined the company. So have you seen that trend line going up in these seven years? Yes, I think customers are demanding change. It's, it's, not, it's not a trend. Um, I think that we'll continue to see increased almost hyper transparency in all aspects of the beauty industry because it's not enough anymore to just think about what what's in the product it we know it starts with the supply chain and understanding how products are produced and packaged and really what goes into that process um, and then as an industry as a whole we can't we have to stop creating things that are negatively impacting our planet, so our fellow humans, our environment, because it's our responsibility to improve the way that we're doing things so that future generations are better off. I think that's real wellness. And I think that Credo's mission aligns with that definition of wellness. And then there's a Maya Angelou quote that I'm sure you all have heard at one point in your life. People will never forget the way you made them feel. Well, I think that our beauty products also have the power to transform the way that we feel about ourselves. And now more than ever before, especially post pandemic, we know that people are buying into brands that align with their values. So it's not just a financial investment anymore. Yes, people vote with their dollars, but this is an emotional investment that people are making. So. You know, we're going to continue to do the work and hopefully one day all beauty will be clean beauty. It's, 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 I know we could go much deeper into this topic, but I, I appreciate your input on all of this. And I, I think too, like really underlining that point you just made around the concept of the pandemic's impact on the consumer. And I don't think we can overemphasize that. We, we've basically been talking about that in the series for two years and it's you cannot overemphasize the change in the consumer because of the pandemic. Um, so, Ali, thank you. I know you're going to hang around, take some questions at the end as well. Um, but for now, I'd like to introduce our next guest, Janine Guerrero. She's head of marketing and digital transformation for the Fine Fragrance team at Jividon. She's a seasoned marketing exec who has been honored by CEW as one of the beauty industry's top talents for her outstanding career accomplishments. First place to start with you, Janine, is, is maybe just a description of Jividon if people haven't heard of it. It is not a brand name you would necessarily know by going into your local retailer. No, absolutely. Hi, it's it's wonderful to be here with you. And I'll certainly can start with explaining a little bit about Jividon. We're certainly a little bit more behind the scenes. Um, we are, in fact, one of the leading global companies in terms of developing tastes and, and, and fragrances. Most people know us from their, either their favorite drinks or their meals or some of their favorite beauty products, even um, down to personal care and laundry detergents and things like that. We work with you know, brands across the spectrum, so big legacy businesses to some of the more entrepreneurial emerging brands. 
and our heritage actually dates back over 250 years. So we have a long history of developing some of those big iconic scents that you would see in some of the prestige department stores now. And our journey along the way has been marked with um, milestones in invention and innovation and creativity and lots of acquisitions now along the way. But at the end of the day, I like to say that it's all about inspiring emotion and delighting consumers around the world. So that's what Jivadon is all about. In fact, our ethos and our our purpose statement is about creating for happier, healthier lives with love for nature. So that's who we are in a nutshell. (laughs) Um, There's there's several threads in there again that I'd like to pull on, but we'll come back to in a second. I'm super fascinated by the technology involved. Let's mm-hmm. come back to that in a second and start with more just kind of the traditional work of, of scent. Mm-hmm. When I think of scent, that is the first thing I think of when I when I think of well-being, right? Mm-hmm. I, and I, I, I was thinking about this and I think it goes back to my grandma who used to talk about how she, you know, she couldn't sleep in the evening because we were all stressing her out too much. She would put lavender oil on her pillow at night. That to me is, is the first definition of wellness I ever like approached in my in my life. So I think about that with that historical knowledge in mind. I'm wondering if if Jividon has been tracking this trend over your 250 plus years. And as we just were talking about the pandemic, you know, what what sort of this pandemic period has done to wellness and scent and our, our reliance on that? Absolutely. And it's interesting that you tell the story of your grandma because we all have those wonderful stories and those scent memories. In fact, we call them something, we call them imprinted smells and they're incredibly powerful. Um, In fact, those fragrances and those notes and those smells, they spark, you know, incredible memories and feelings, emotions at the heart, and they transport us back to moments in our lives and those moments that help us feel better, even in the present. You know, and they, we can remake those. We can, you know, make them into invigorating shower gels that wake us up or scented candles or products that help us, you know, to your point, help us wind down, help us calm down, bring us comfort in, in times of incredible stress and anxiety. You know, for me, it was, you know, being in my grandma's kitchen in those kind of kitchen memories. Um, everyone has the moment. And so amazingly, our personal smell library actually begins to develop for us way back in the womb at about, believe it or not, 24 weeks old. And we all have the unique scent of, I'm going to call them smell memory connections that continue to operate, you know, 24-7 throughout our lives. And most of us are not even aware of us. So if you think about the power of scent and the role that it plays in proving our well-being, it has incredible power to trigger positive responses. It's, you know, it's that feel good factor that we're all looking for. So it's really important, you know, for us to sort of what you say, track all of this and because they evolve and they change and we stay incredibly close to it. Um, And we certainly did that as a company uh, before COVID, but during COVID, everything got accelerated and we ke- and we became even more laser focused on this because we we saw right away that this well-being started to get reprioritized and so at Juvenon, we have our own proprietary panels of consumers that you know we've done waves and waves of study we stayed you know very close to consumers literally asking them how do you feel what are you doing you know what are you thinking you know down to for our through the lens of the olfactive we really wanted to understand their sense of self how it was changing in, in addition to that, we have our own, um, we have this incredibly, um, you know, scientific center of research, our health and well-being center of excellence in Ashford, UK. And through that, we have, you know, very rich um, studies done to really understand how consumers think, what they're feeling. So we, we're taking all of that understanding um, to really develop the tools that we need to, at the end of the day, develop fragrances that are really going to have a positive effect on consumers' well-being. We started the hour looking at a, a piece of data from Intel um, mm-hmm. that kind of showed the, the, what they are projecting the, the future of this wellness space to look like specifically around women and women's well-being. Um, I, I'm wondering, because you do the same, similar research to what they do, yes. what is the trend line looking like to you? Are, are you predicting out yet? Do you have a sense of what's coming? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a couple of really important things that we started to see. Um, absolutely. Um, 
the rise, and this is what we're calling self-empowerment. So this idea of I'm worth it, right? Mm -hmm. So we certainly saw, you know, this buzzword that we're all using self-care, self-care, self-care. So now we're starting to see that everyone, you know, women, men, young, old, this this acceptance and almost this, it's okay that I, I should be selfish. I should put myself first because I'm a better person for others when I'm a better person for myself. So that yeah. becomes incredibly important. Um, and certainly our studies and, and third-party studies validated that. Certainly and the good news for us is that the importance of the role of scent on emotion and, you know, consumers are very smart, very savvy. They did their homework. They're still doing their homework, but they understand that scent, science-backed scent, can have a positive ascent, have a positive effect on their emotion. You know, our studies reveal that almost 90% of people believe that fragrance or flavor can impact their well-being. So that was great news, but, you know, you have to science back it and innovation back it and technology back it. And then the third really important thing that we saw the evolution of is this idea of expression of myself. And this was really exciting for us because that we were breaking out of our norms. So, you know, masculinity, femininity, breaking down of these, you know, traditional codes is really evolving. And that's exciting for us to see. So it's it's so interesting. So you take this information that you guys have, have done and, and, you know, certainly understanding the concept of it's about the self and the, you know, you, you talk about self, self, self. And then I think about, well, but fragrance, I don't really create my own fragrance. I don't like, when I think about scents, I have to go to the store and I search for the candle that comes as closest to aligning. So you take this, all this information you've done, you take it to a brand and how do they begin interpreting it and using it? So um, there's a couple of things. There's, you know, you certainly have to stick to the DNA of the brand. So back to my point earlier that consumers are really smart. And, you know, Ali made a great point about, um, you know, consumers, you have to stick to the values that consumers, you know, want, you know, they, they know what their values and they want to align with a brand that is aligned with their own values. So that's really important to understand. Um, you have to understand that consumers want a holistic approach. So they want to be authentic. They want science backed. So we take all of this groundbreaking research that we have. And then at the end of the day, we have to create fragrances that have all of the, the science backed that consumers want. So this, this is done with um, some technologies that we develop. So we have certain patents that give our perfumers the guidelines to create fragrances that have all of this technology in them. So consumers are getting something that is, you know, credible, authentic, is going to give them the benefits that they need in a product that they're looking for. And then it has to align with the brand. So we work very closely with individual brands to make sure that it all um, works together. So can I dump down this technology as easy as yes. possible for me to understand Absolutely. in my simple little mind? So you're it, 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 this weekend, I wanted fur. I wanted to smell fur, not the fur of a pet, but like a fur tree. And so I went and I found a soap that was called fur and it smelled as I wanted it to. Now, do you have technology or do you have some sort of patent that says when someone smells fur, they now feel comfort in their home or that it puts them in an outside tranquil space or like, what is the technology in this? Mm -hmm. I guess is my question. I'm just trying to get my head around that. Yeah, so there's a couple of different technologies. So they're neuroscience technologies. Um, they're called, we have uh, a couple called mood sense technologies. So they translate into three specific moods, happy, invigorating, and relaxing. Then there are Viva Sense technologies, which um, translate into well-being. And then there's dream sense. Um, and those are very specific to um, um, well-being. Okay. And they're actually creative guidelines that perfumers use to create in, in, um, within their formulas. So, and they can be, you know, the, across the olfactive spectrum. So fascinating. And, and, you, and the same thing in the flavor space. I mean, you're, you're also just, just, I know we focused on this piece Absolutely. of our conversation, but you're applying the same technology, the same thoughts and guidance to food flavors. Absolutely. Yes. Wow. All right. Last question for you for this point is what, what do you see the future of health and wellness evolving toward? So I think um, for me, there's a couple of things. I think that in order for it to have a positive 
effect on on well-being of consumers. It has to absolutely have, it has to be emotion-driven for sure. It has to have um, science and technology backed, and it has to allow for self-expression and a sense of identity in it. So if those three elements are there, <clears throat> it absolutely will be a success. I didn't address at all this, you know, clean, you know, with or without natural ingredients, all alternatives. Certainly that's a big piece of it as well. I'm absolutely just focused on the olfactive piece of it, but that's a big part of it as well. But that's a whole conversation that I think Ali did an incredible job speaking to. (laughs) Uh, And we can certainly come back to it because obviously Mm -hmm. people can submit their questions. So thank you, Janine. So interesting. Um, I've really learned a lot from you. There's so many things I did not know. Um, which is a, an understatement. Um, thank you. Our last guest, part of the team that co-founded Seaweed Naturals. They currently have a THC-based product range that's sold in dispensaries. They're also working on a line of supplements that will launch before the end of the year. So welcome with me, uh, Jill Blasco and Ashlyn Cousteau. Ashlyn, if I can start with you, you're a successful entertainment journalist. You had stints at E! as well as Entertainment Tonight. Your husband is also a co-founder on this brand. He is Philippe Cousteau, grandson of the famed ocean explorer Jacques Cousteau. So I'm sort of curious to find how we get a journalist and an ocean explorer to found a wellness brand. Well, he is really cute. Uh, I'll start with that. So that's (laughs) always a plus. Um, Well, so for for those of you, uh, because depending on your age, Cousteau may be very familiar or not familiar. So let me just say, yes, uh, Jacques Cousteau, Philippe's grandfather, he was an incredibly famous ocean explorer. He was the first person, he invented scuba diving, he invented the actual uh, device that you use, the aqualung. Um, We still use it today when we go scuba diving. And again, he had an undersea world of Jacques Cousteau, which truly opened up people's eyes to what the sea looked like. Because before that, we didn't even know what a fish or a dolphin or a shark looked like swimming under the ocean. We just knew what it looked like when it came above ground or above the water. Um, So so Philippe and his father, Philippe Sr., they and, and Jacques dedicated their lives to ocean health. And I, there's something that always has stuck with me, and it is a, is a quote that Jacques would say all the time, and it was, we cannot have human sustainability without having environmental sustainability. Mm. And I think that is so true. And when we talk about health and wellness, we really need to think about that. But I want to take it a step further, because I believe, and, and Philippe believes with me, that sustainability is a mediocre goal at best these days. We don't want to sustain the planet the way it is. We don't want to sustain the ocean the way it is. We really need to start thinking about restoration and how we can regenerate our our planet, our ocean, and ourselves Mm -hmm. back to true health. So me coming from the entertainment side, you know, as I was going to these ocean conferences with Philippe, I really realized that it was kind of always the same people and they were always talking about the same things, kind of talking amongst themselves and, and not reaching out to a broader audience. So that's kind of where my pop culture, marketing, media, storytelling hat came, came in to be. And, you know, what we really wanted to do was show people, number one, what a truly impactful brand can look like. As we're speaking at the UN, we're speaking to you know, leaders of countries, we're speaking to schools around the world. People say, okay, great, we get this. We want to be sustainable. We want to be restorative. What brands can we buy from? And usually the only answer we had was Patagonia. So we realized that there was a a space there for people who wanted to make a tangible difference with their their purchase. And obviously for us, we we look at the ocean as the lifeline of our planet. It controls our weather. It produces two-thirds of the oxygen that we breathe. So without a healthy ocean, none of us are going to have health and wellness. Uh, and, and we started kind of looking at that and, and Jill, who you're going to hear from, from in just a second is just an incredible mind in, in the beauty and, and wellness and, and consumer product space. And she really talked to us about, well, what's, what's your hero product? And to us, we really thought about seaweed and kelp because while it has been used for millennia and there's so many incredible brands out there like La Mer, who we love, where that is their hero ingredient. But a lot of people don't take that next step to think about, well, seaweed and kelp, some species grow two feet a day. Seaweed and kelp help restore the pH balance of the area. 
They help uh, provide nurseries for fish. Uh, they help oxy uh, bring oxygen back into the water. So truly healthy kelp and, and, and healthy ocean ecosystems can fix our ocean, not just sustain it, it can fix it. So we knew that that was gonna be our, our hero product. And then we worked with Jill into, you know, really, where, okay, where can we find consumers that are gonna care about this? COVID hit and here in California, um, cannabis was an essential business. So we honestly went from thinking about doing a CBD brand to doing a THC brand. Uh, it's a, it was a big swing, especially for a family, three generations, four generations now with our children brand. But we realized that that's okay. And that's what we needed. We wanted to, to make a splash, for lack of a better term, get people's attention and really bring this restorative ingredients and this restorative, impactful, truly impactful restorative business to new consumers. Because yes, packaging is so important, right? I love what Ali was saying about Credo. I just recycled actually so many of my bottles just the other day at, at my West Hollywood Credo. So we got to talk about packaging. We have to think about the give back, but we also need to think again about making that tangible difference in our world and that immediate difference for our planet and our ocean. And that's why we use uh, restoratively farmed kelp. It's, it's, it's interesting, Jill, let's, let's pop over to you because you come at this from a slightly different angle. You, you have this history guiding beauty brands to, yeah. to success. So what was it about this brand? Was it the THC? Was it the kelp? Was it the combination? Was it the right time, right place? Where, where, what brought you in the space? Well, as you mentioned, Tom, my background is 30 years of fragrance and cosmetics. Um, I got into the cannabis industry I don't know, five years ago, uh, it seemed like a natural progression for me. The industry itself, a little bit of the Wild West since it became recreational available. However, um, the power of the cannabinoids that are in the plant is uh, is hard to ignore. The medicinal power, the, the wellness power of that plant. And once I got into it, it was it was so riveting and so interesting what the plant could do that I fell in love with it. So I became part of the industry. I work with two or three large clients. And over the past couple of years, it became very clear that the largest, the fastest growing demographic that we see in dispensaries is older women with disposable income. And anybody who's in the, the beauty industry knows we love her. She's the person that buys our stuff. So if that demographic is blossoming at dispensaries, that's where we want to be. Um, she's going there for a lot of reasons, but primarily um, when you when stuff starts to, people start to get carpal tunnel or arthritis or, an ups, or skin issues or whatever. And there are so many different cannabinoids that work to alleviate. Um, the first people who started using certain THC products were, were cancer doctors who used them to help with uh, side effects of chemotherapy and radiation. Um, there's a doctor in upstate New York, <coughs> excuse me, who was very much against using THC for anything. And he deals specifically with brain cancer and brain tumors. I saw him speak last year and boy, has he changed his tune. And he, he has a ton of his patients who are in these studies now because literally there are ingredients in the plant that can help uh, slow the growth of tumors that, can, that do a lot of medicinal things that big pharma isn't doing right now. So for me, it was a no brainer to be in the industry. Um, I've been friends with uh, Philippe for 15 years, been friends with Ash since she came on the scene many years ago. And we've always talked about doing some brand that honored uh, Philippe's grandfather's legacy. Unlike Ashlyn and probably all of you, I'm old enough to remember watching the undersea world of Jacques Cousteau every week. My mom was nice enough to let me stay up. And it truly was the first time we saw a, the biggest part of our environment and nobody ever knew what it looked like before. I mean, we just didn't know, we had no idea. So we'd been talking for a long time about what can we put together that will honor the legacy of the Cousteau family, but will also uh, take us to the next level in terms of wellness ingredients. So as Ashlyn said, while we were working together through the pandemic, we originally thought we we're gonna launch a CBD from hemp line. 
which just in case anyone's wondering about that, CBD, CBD from hemp does have great qualities. It works better in combination with some THC, even if it's a slight amount. Um, so we originally had planned to, to do that first. And then as we sort of looked, looked at our research and did our focus group studies, it was pretty obvious to us that we could make a bigger difference with, with the efficacy of THC combined with it. Not to mention, it was the only retailer that was going to be open for the three years in California that, that we were in the pandemic, two and a half years. So um, we switched our, our launch plans relatively quickly. We had great formulators work with us, and it just made sense for us to, to put out a wellness brand, really leaning on raw ingredients from the sea, combined with land plant ingredients for, for efficacy. Well, I, I kind of want to pull on that thread a little bit. So okay. the, the, when you think about these, you know, sort of natural ingredients, right? I, I, what I'm curious to know from you is how does the consumer respond? Because what I've heard from everybody speaking today is it's, it's everybody wants efficacy. First, it's about taking care of myself. Second, it's taking care of myself with products that actually work. And, and there's enough products and enough research to prove it all now. So when, when we get to kelp and THC, is the consumer coming along on the journey or, or are you having to really still convince them? Where, where are they in this? I, I think, Ash, if you don't mind, I'll jump in on this one. Yeah. I think the consumer is already there on ocean ingredients. She's already buying supplements at GNC or at Ralph's or whatever. She already gets that there are um, ingredients from the ocean that work. So I think yeah. she's already there. Uh, just based on what I see when I walk into CVS, there are acres of products that use some form of seaweed or kelp or fish oil. Um, frankly, if I'm talking to a consumer in a dispensary, she, re she already understands the plant's ability for healing. Um, when I talk to people who are not in the THC world, who are not already there, yes, they do require a little bit of guidance but they're getting there. And as more and more states, and thank you, President Biden, for three days ago for decriminalizing, at least in the places that he could, um, as people become more and more educated about the effects of plants, um, it will become easier. But there is a little education that goes, but you know what, Tom, it's similar to the education we do behind the counter at a department store or mm -hmm. at Sephora. Once the, once the information is in the hands of the consumer, and she tries it, you've got her. I mean, I sent out to a bunch of friends the first go round of tinctures and balms um, to friends who are my age, who are older than 50, who much older in my case, but who, who had specific issues. Your knees go, you got a backache, your, you know, your hands from the arthritis. And almost without exception, we very quickly had people texting me saying, where can I buy this? my husband's knee has felt better than it's felt in three years. So, yeah. so once people try it and understand how the plants work, you got a customer for life. And then she's brave enough or he's brave enough to walk into a dispensary. Well, it sounds like they're also your, your evangelist. It, 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 sorry, Angela, and I want you to speak on it too, but I, I, that That's word of mouth exactly element right. is invaluable if you can get to it. Ashley, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, yeah no, That's I'm exactly right. I was just going to say too, you know, if you want to look at it uh, from from a conservation standpoint too, I mean, there are so many big tech, big ideas out there to solve these world problems that we have, right? From superstorms to our ocean warming to all these things, but there's some low hanging fruit too. Yeah. For instance, um, omega threes, right? Everybody loves omega threes; they're great for you. The efficacy has been proven on that ingredient. So a lot of people, when they take their omega-3s, they're getting it from fish oil and krill oil. But here's the kicker. Fish and krill don't make their own omega-3s. They get it from eating algae. Yeah. So yeah. literally, we can just cut out the middle man, the middle fish, and give people omega-3s that don't have toxics in them, that don't have heavy metals in them. They don't have to cook the fish oil or the krill oil so much that it's literally oxidized by the time you take it, which is then actually worse for you than not taking it at all. Mm -hmm. And we can keep 
millions and millions of tons of fish and krill in our ocean where they belong to again help regenerate this ocean ecosystem so as far as like jill was saying for education too it's just a little bit of education goes such a long way for people when they want to talk about the efficacy of the product or how it's going to save the planet and therefore how it's going to help all of our health yeah and What's i also interesting. think oh, oh, yeah, sorry, ahead, Tom, i was going to say i also think in terms of conservation I think consumers now, unlike 10 years ago, expect companies to be as green as they can possibly be. We used to all say, yes, as green as we can, yeah. and then we'd move on. So I think the seaweed naturals focus on uh, recycled and recyclable packaging and regenerative raw ingredients, that's expected. Um, certainly from any company that would call itself environmentally conscious or sustainable or whatever. To Ashlyn's point, we don't want to just sustain. We want to regenerate. We want to recover. Yeah. And that's important to us. Um, the, the, I, I kind of wanted to, to dive in a bit more on the give back element, because that, that is kind of a big, important piece of this wellness space. There seems to always be a give back piece. But I sometimes wonder if it's just performative. And by no means am I implying that you all are doing it performatively. The Cousteau's have a history of doing this. So this isn't questioning your, your you know, uh, true, <laughs> true believerness. Of course not. In oh, this. But, yeah. But, but you do, you, do you feel that in some ways that some of these brands are just performatively adding a give back to get people to jump on board, which obviously is an opening for you to talk about your give back, but like compare it, go ahead and be judgmental of some others. Go ahead, okay. Ashley. You're into it this, is, I know. I am like, when companies say that they are doing well because they give back 1% to the planet, that's bullshit. Because giving back 1% of the planet while you are taking and using yeah. what the planet is giving to us and you're hurting it, that 1% or even, you know, 5%, whatever the number is, it's not enough. I mean, it's a nice to have. It's almost like when you pat somebody on the head and you say, oh, you're so nice. Bless your heart. Yeah. Bless your it's, heart. <laughs> that should be at least expected. I mean, but it, but truly, and also where the give back is going, I think is also very important. Um, so for us, we are giving a give back. 5% of our profits are going back to Earth Echo, which is Philippe's nonprofit that's all about educating youth about the importance of our ocean planet and empowering them to actually do actions to save the planet. Um, and also working out of Altice that is helping train people that have been left historically neglected, communities that have been left out of the, uh, the emerging blue economy uh, and training them in, into these clean jobs. But again, I think it's, it is really important for brands not to just have a give back, to not just work on their packaging, but they need to do it all. You need to, like Jill said, you need, to, you need to have sustainable packaging. You need to have a give back, but you also need to make sure that your product is helping the planet and not hurting it. And I truly believe that, that with, um, with the new consumers out there, they're feisty and they are knowledgeable. And if your company isn't doing the right thing, you're not going to make your bottom line because your yeah. consumers are going to go other places. So again, it's not just good for the environment, but it's going to be good for businesses too, to do the right thing for our world. I, I want to invite um, Ali and Janine to rejoin us. And uh, it's been about the last 10 minutes and remind our audience, please use the Q&A button at the bottom, submit a question to us. But as, as they get themselves back, turned back on and cameras on, I, I'm curious to, for Ashlyn and Jill, just to start, you know, Ali was talking and one of the things I find so interesting about Credo is they've got this dirty list. Is that as a brand who is coming up, is there something interesting in that for you in identifying these other brands that can give you a seal of approval? Is that something you're interested in? And, and, and I mean, it seems obvious, but for what reason? Yeah, no, I, I think it's very important. I think that sometimes brands like, look, Philippe and I, number one, we are already starting off a little ahead in the group of knowing kind of in the group of um, conservation, you know, knowing what products are good or ingredients are good and what's bad, obviously with Jill's background and she just brings so much more, but you know, a lot of people that are starting off, they don't know. They don't know that, you know, mineral oil, it can be petroleum based. They don't, like they don't realize that. So I think, you know, what, what Credo does and what the environmental working group does to, to really show, um, what, 
things are good and when things are bad and how you can help save the health of our water by not putting, you know, sulfates and, and phosphates in your shampoo. That's amazing. I mean, that is, that is what companies should do. And, and that is what all people, and hopefully some of these students that are listening, you know, they're listening, that are thinking of doing a brand. I mean, you should, that should be the bare minimum. Right. I mean, technically those, most of those chemicals that Allie has on our list should probably be banned from the United States, but that's going to take lobbying and that's a whole nother thing. Um, but, um, but yes, I think that is incredible that brands are doing that because it's, it is, it is a must have. Allie, I kind of want to spin this to you, but in sort of a, an interesting way. And we talked on, touched on this just briefly the other day, but the, the, when you think about clean beauty, and I just listening to Ashlyn just describe, everything she's describing sounds to me like it costs a lot more to make than some cover girl cosmetic. You know, is the consumer willing to spend in the space or is it only a particular consumer? Will we ever get to a mass beauty brand that's able to deliver something like what, you know, Seaweed Naturals is, is doing? Yeah, we talked a little bit too about the inclusivity aspect of these clean beauty products. And I think also a large part of that is the price point of the products. So there are more and more brands that are clean and clean to credo standards. Um, if you know of any, please submit them on our behalf that are affordable options for people who are just starting to navigate this space and want to test out the waters. But we talked a little bit about it, Tom, too, privately, separately during our interview about how these large prestige mass brands, they've been doing, they've been working in a way that for forever, that they, they haven't changed yet. And they're not that willing, but we hope that with the consumer demand, they're gonna have to eventually, and they will be forced to evaluate their bottom line, their cost of goods and see where they're gonna have to, you know, give and take a little bit to meet the consumer where they're at now, which is, all of you spoke on it, highly educated, they know what they're looking for, and they're willing to put up a fight too. So there's yeah. going to have to be change eventually, it's just going to take time. Janine, are you seeing brands a little more willing to spend on the ingredients and knowing that they could get more out of the back end of it? Absolutely. And I think um, we've all been sort of saying the same thing. The brands are almost at the mercy of the consumer because the consumer is smart and, and they're doing their homework and the brands have got to deliver or they're not going to survive at all. And I think, you know, as, as, as we are, we're sort of educating the brands on, they don't know what they don't know. So now we're having to do almost their homework to say, here's what you have to do in order to be successful. And you have to put, you know, you have to put the investment into your brand if you want to reap the rewards. And, and it's about being authentic and giving the consumer what they want. And you can't do, you can't do almost what was done in the past, which was like, it's great storytelling. It's, you have to be like from, we call it from brief to bottle, meaning like, here's the request and here's what's going to end up on the shelf. And it has to be like through and through. So, and if you're not going to do it right, then don't, don't do it at all. Jill, I know you've been in this industry for a minute, and I'm, I'm just curious your thoughts on, on kind of where this is headed. You know, you, when you think about costs, when you think about what the consumer is buying, what, what, what she's looking for in the world, where does this go? Well, I think, as I said before, we all know that our, our demographic, which is slightly older women with some money to burn, that's always been the place we wanted to be. At, particularly in the United States, as the population gets older, she becomes a bigger part of your portfolio. Um, she's smart, she's got a little extra cash and she's willing to pay for it. Brands that are going for clean, specific givebacks, they're probably gonna sell a little bit easier, even at a higher ticket to someone who's a little bit older. Are we gonna convince a 20 year old who has a limited budget to go out and spend 15, 20% more in a wellness product? Probably not. But someone who is 40, she's probably going to spend a little. If she gets back, the product works. It's got an amazing story. It, it gives back and it does environmentally what she sees as the right thing to do. So I think we've sort of moved the wellness needle a little bit 
as we watch who that consumer is. Um, that's number one. Number two, I also think as we get farther and farther along this trajectory in the wellness category, stuff becomes less expensive. There becomes yeah. a, when there becomes a, a reason for people to grow kelp, when there becomes a reason for people to produce the ingredients that are clean, when there are customers there to buy their raw materials, that stuff becomes more competitive and the price goes down a little. So I think at the beginning of, of a cycle, you always get a little hit in terms of cost, but then it evens out and kind of becomes more mainstream. I wonder for any of you, if, if we keep talking about she, I know for me as the, as the one he who's here, um, the, as I've gotten further into my forties, I am willing to invest more than I used to, to prevent and maybe turn around some signs of aging. Um, at least that's what the commercials tell me these products are going to do. Um, <laughs> Is, is the men's market in this space growing? To be honest, the only reason I came to clean beauty was because a friend recommended it, which I think the research shows that's kind of how men find their yeah. way to beauty to begin with. But it, it, for any of you or all of you, the thoughts on the, the male piece in that, or is that a white space that hasn't been exploited yet? Yeah, Jill. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I have noticed that we all know that, you know, the largest percentage of in our, in our industry, the largest percentage of customers are women. However, in wellness, I think, and, and somebody else jumped in who knows this, but it appears to me that women now buy a lot of stuff for men. They certainly do in the traditional straight marriage where some are straight relationship where somebody goes home and says, honey, look, I bought these for you. or I bought this moisturizer for you. I bought that for you. When I say women in dispensaries, I'm specific about women because that is who is who's brave enough to go in a dispensary the first time. But overall in wellness, um, we, we're working very hard to make sure our products have no specific gender identification to them. We're not say, look, pink, you know, we're, we're not doing any of that because we do know that there are men out there who are uh, focused on wellness. And most of them hear from word of mouth, as you said, Tom. So um, he's out there. Does he spend enough yet? No, but I think eventually we'll get there. And Tom, Jean, too, I, one, thing, the one thing that we're really excited about is, is we're actually launching a new business um, in December and it is uh, called Sivoir, but it is going to just, it's going to be a vegan omega-3, which is why I was talking about the importance of omega-3 um, um, from plants. And, and I'm, I'm really excited because I think that our, it'll be either split or it might even be more men that are gonna buy that. Right, uh, which is really we'll exciting. Selling, yeah. yeah, which is really exciting for us. So I, I think that you know when, when we do think of wellness, sometimes we tend to go more beauty, but also, I mean, the supplements game in the United States alone is a yeah. trillion, not, you know, multiple trillions. Um, so we're really excited about that too, because when you think of wellness in terms of supplements, then I think it actually does skew more, more male. I agree. I agree. Janine, I saw, you, saw your hand shoot up. Did you have something to add on the, the um, men's piece? I absolutely say that we are seeing um, growth opportunities and emergence of men embracing more what we, what we call, aside from the mood enhancement, what we call our nature conscious fragrance design. So certainly in the clean space, so fragrances made without certain ingredients to adhere to like the credo norms or the Sephora, mm -hmm. clean at Sephora. And then we have the whole palette of um, fragrances that are made with or without naturals or a certain level of naturals or natural alternatives. And then all of those fragrances that we're developing with like upcycled materials or biodegradable materials, those are, those are the materials that are specifically made for like sustainable planet um, in mind. So, and men are definitely gravitating more towards that. And I think, you know, it's a little bit of a slower trajectory, but definitely on the rise for sure. Ali, I want to give you the last word. Yeah, yeah, please yeah. evolve this question or however you want to take it. I think there's something interesting. I from really your agree. Um, there's definitely a surgence of gender neutral beauty. So, whether it's a brand that's focused on like knowing no boundaries, there's no gender, there's no, we're all human. So beauty is about being human. And we even are seeing it now in our color cosmetic brands that these products can be used by anyone. So it's a yeah. really interesting 
and it's really great too to to be seeing it all unfold that beauty knows no bounds it's for everyone it's a great way of putting it i i think i i take away from our conversation today that you know it's it's the evolution of the consumer towards self care first and then it's second about the efficacy of whatever it is is you are creating. And so I, I just want to thank the four of you for helping kind of drive those points home. And I know there was many other pieces in amongst all of that, but but truly thank you to the four of you for taking the time out for chatting with us this afternoon. Thank you um, for as us, Tom. My pleasure. Um, as always, uh, we'll send a link in the next day or so to a recording of today's event, as well as a link to RSVP to our upcoming panel in November. We've actually just changed the programming on that one. So November's panel is the future of inclusivity and belonging. We have some great guests lined up, which is why we ended up changing the, the subject matter for the month. Um, and we thought too, that'll be our last panel for the year. We thought that would be a great way to sort of end 2022 as it's kind of been the theme that's kind of interwoven itself into all of our topics throughout the year this year. Um, if you can't get enough of me, I also have a podcast now with the college. Office Hour with Tom and Mimi is available on all your major podcasting platforms. Um, we drop new episodes every Thursday. Last week's episode was actually on the beauty industry as well. Tina Perez from our, our beauty, uh, I'm not gonna get the name of the major right, but it is our beauty degree. Uh, she's the director of that program. Uh, she joined us to discuss uh, what was going on with men's beauty. Um, with Brad Pitt dropping a new line and uh, several yeah. others that I'm not thinking of right now. Um, but we have a new episode dropping this Thursday as well. We will see you next month if you join us for Future Of. And until we meet again, always we encourage you to stay inspired. Thanks again to Janine, Ashlyn, Jill, and 